Hi, wonderful YouTube family. Lisa A. Romano here, the Breakthrough Life Coach, and today we're going to be talking to sons and daughters of narcissists, adult children from dysfunctional homes, and those of us who have recognized that we're codependents and or empaths and or survivors of narcissistic abuse. And one of the things that I think that really prevents us from being able to really just go crazy with our recovery, like really, really just be emotionally free and emotionally liberated from the, um, the spell that codependency is. And codependency is really, really deep. And it's a matter of enmeshment. We enmesh with everything. We have no clear boundaries. We were disrespected as children, so we don't understand that we have any right to our feelings, any right to our experiences, any right to defend ourselves, any right to be angry. We need permission to be angry. We, meet, we need permission to be happy. We need permission to say enough. Um, and so today I want to talk about something that has that was really critical in my own recovery that just hit me. I thought, you know what, I should probably do a YouTube video about that because it was it was so liberating. And so I wanted to address this idea that um, people have to like us. And why is it so difficult? Why do we have such a hard time as codependents and empaths and people who have been abused by narcissists as, as adults? So why do we have so many problems as adults with, with our emotions when we discover that someone doesn't like us? And so I wanted to explore that. And I think one of the reasons that it's so difficult for us is because we have been brainwashed to think people have to like us. Hang on. Think about it. When we were children, we naturally sought our parents' validation. That's what children do when they incarnate on earth. They know that they are below their parents on the totem pole and they come into this experience, we all did, needing and well, having this innate need to belong or feel, everything's energetic, we're feeling beings. So everything's about our feelings. So we came into this world feeling like we needed to belong to these big people. And when they were unable to connect to us, we were infused with a sense, our heart was infused with the sense that we were being rejected. Our heart sends those signals to our brain, the brain sends the signals back. And as children, we can't separate from that, that I don't belong feeling. We don't know we're being rejected by them. We just feel rejected. We feel rejectable. We feel unworthy. So we merge and we mesh with the rejection. That's a, that's a, that's a big one, dear ones. And you really have to meditate about that. And I want you to journal about that. So when it's very important that when you have, when we all, it's very cliche to hear people say in ACOA and CODA and Al-Anon and all our 12 step programs that you have triggered my abandonment. What does that mean? So we experienced abandonment, but dear ones, you were abandoned. No child is abandonable. Is that the right word? You know what I mean? But no child is disposable. No child is disposable. But what happens is when you experience yourself as being disposable, when you have been wounded from the outside and people make you feel like you are disposable, when you're a child, you merge with that feeling. You can't separate, they're making me feel that way. You don't know that the big people are making a mistake in your life. So what happens is you absorb and enmesh with the feeling of being discarded and then you carry this shame. <gasps> I am discardable. That's an illusion, dear one. That's why I always say, it's not you, it's your programming. That's the name of my next book. That's the name of my, my live seminars. It's not you, it's your programming. And I am never going to stop trying to share that message with the world because I think it's so important that yes, you were abandoned, but you need to separate, separate from that feeling and understand that that feeling was given to you. It is not you. You are not discardable. You are worthy. You always were worthy, but your parents infused you with the, this idea that you weren't. So let's get back to why is it such a problem for us to stay stable when we feel like other people don't agree with us? Because that is a product, dear ones, of our childhood brainwashing. We have all been brainwashed to think that we need our mother and father's approval. It's even in the Bible. 
but I'm not so sure that commandment represents what we've been taught it means. Honor thy mother and father might mean honor the male and female energy that you are, the divine fem feminine and divine masculine that you are, that, because we're all male and female. So when you, you, when you honor your complete self, that's when, you, that's when you experience integration. That's when you understand, oh my God, I was always worthy. It's just this damn friggin' programming from my, <laughs> from my parents who were alcoholics or narcissists or aloof or schizophrenic, whatever their issue was, whatever, everybody's got issues, dear one. You know, even well-meaning um, parents have, you know, in, infused their children with confusion have infused their ch children at one point or another with the idea that what they think is unimportant. You know, if you're a child, it's, it's impossible not to be wounded because you are so sensitive. You're absorbing everything. You're this radio receiver. And parents, you know, because they got the mortgage to pay and they've got two or three kids or four kids or 12 kids or 17 kids to take care of, they sometimes in their state, they're not paying attention to what that, that individual child needs. And when that child is being ignored in that moment, that child is receiving the input from the experience. And again, all children, well, no children can separate from feeling abandoned with an understanding that, that they are, they're doing this to me. They merge with the feeling of, of abandonment and then they feel unworthy. And then the, the brain can't challenge the feelings that come in. The, remember, the brain takes everything as truth. So, your brain isn't going to argue with, argue with you when you're two and say, listen, your mother's overworked. She's got a bun in the oven. She's got another kid coming. You know, your father's an alcoholic. And even though she didn't sit down and play blocks with you, that does, and you feel unworthy, you're not unworthy. It's just that's the emotions that are showing up, up in you because your need isn't being met at this time. Your brain doesn't do that. And so, so what happens is when you experience feeling rejected, you merge with the feeling and your brain says, yep, you're rejectable. Yep, I'm discardable or whatever. And eventually all these links get created and ultimately the mortal wound is I am not enough. I know that I carried, carried that well into my 30s. And when I was triggered by someone who was talking bad about me, that, that, that's when the I am not enough wound got kicked up. And that's when my ego was like, wanted to protect the inner child who felt like she wasn't enough. And the ego said, you know, went, went to town, like, you know, attacked people. Like I became self-righteous, you know, and I thought that no one had a right to be talking bad about me. And it all went back to feeling like I needed other people's validation. That's where the brainwashing was in my head. My mother, if I went home and I told my mother that, you know, you know, Richie made fun of me, my mother's first response was, well, what did you do? It was, there was no, there was, there was never a moment where it was, well, how does that make you feel? You know, there were no Brady Bunch moments in my house. You know, they just did not exist. It was like, shut up, get out of here. You're being a baby, suck it up, move on with it. Just ignore him or whatever. There was no, I wasn't allowed to experience my, my experience. I wasn't allowed to like, express myself. I wasn't allowed to have an experience of that experience. So what happens is when you feel wounded as a child and you're being made fun of or criticized and bullied, and then there's no one in your environment that it validates strong enough mentally and emotionally and psychologically to validate you. What happens is they don't know what to do with it. They tell you to forget about it and you suppress it. And so suppression and repression equals depression. And certainly I suffered from clinical depression and panic disorder amongst a myriad of other things, you know, as we all do, as we all do, we've all been wounded, you know, that's just a reality. I don't care who looks like they've got it together. They got this stuff going on. Um, we're just talking about it. That's the only thing that separates from us from them, from us and them is that we actually talk about it, which is cool. Whatever. No big deal. That's my journey. This is your journey, you know, so let them be. So part of what keeps us stuck is this brainwashing that we experience as children that has us under the spell. And it is a spell, okay, because it's a lie. It's an illusion. We don't need anyone's permission to feel anything. We don't need anyone to agree with us, period. We don't have to defend our position, period. We don't have to explain ourselves, period. Our experience is our unique experience, period. Did I say period? 
Got it. So, 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 but when you're a child, you're brainwashed over and over. And how do children get brainwashed? Through repetition, through observation and consistency. So we're brainwashed to think mommy and daddy, we're supposed to gain mommy and daddy's validation. Mommy and daddy's supposed to like us. Aunt Susie's supposed to like us. Our drunk alcoholic uncle is supposed to like us. You know, grandma's supposed to like us. Grandpa is, is, a, pedo, is a pedophile, but he's supposed to like us, you know. That's the brainwashing. So as adults, unless we really confront that and say, wait a minute, that's a false limiting belief. And this is what I teach in my It's Not You, It's Your Programming. That's one of the steps. That's one of the things that you really have to challenge yourself on because if you think your boss is supposed to like you, you're screwed because <laughs> you can't control whether or not your boss likes you. So your, your, your happiness and your contentment is being placed outside of yourself. So if you think your wife is always supposed to agree with you, you're screwed. If you think you need your wife's permission to leave her, you're screwed. If you think you need your husband's approval to, uh, or permission to leave you and be unhappy, you're screwed because you're going to wait for that person who is more than likely narcissistic or on the scale or on the continuum. You're going to wait for that person to say, yes, you have a right to be miserable. It's okay. You can go. You can leave me. You can have your own unique experience of me. Ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. I know that I stayed as married. I stayed married for as long as I did the first time because there was a limiting belief in my head that had me under the illusion, literally like a zombie, believing that I needed my ex-husband to agree with me with why I thought our marriage was failing. And I, it was probably seven years that I was trying to get him to see what I saw, which is what codependents do. Codependents talk a lot but they don't do anything about what they're talking about. They just talk and talk and talk. Why? Because another limiting belief is that we don't have choices. We've just got to suck it up. We don't have a right to be unhappy. We don't have a right to talk about our feelings. So we're missing that data. If our parents complained, then we complain. If our parents stayed stuck and never took accountability for how they felt, then we do the same thing. So, um, Essentially, what I'm hoping that you get from this, this video today, I'm trying to keep it quick. What I'm hoping that you get from this video today is that you begin questioning your own programming, your own brainwashing. And if you have a difficult time with discovering or, or holding on to yourself when you discover that your mother-in-law has said something negative about you or your sister-in-law doesn't, you know, is, is, is kind of like challenging you, and you, you know the family's setting you up. You know, it's a covert operation. I mean, if you're, your husband or your partner's narcissistic, you know, chances are he's come from a very passive aggressive home. And you're not crazy if you think they're trying to set your ass up. They, they probably are. They probably are. But you've got to learn to disengage because the more energy you sow into that dynamic, the bigger it gets. It's an energy ball. Dynamics are energy balls. And when you want them to shrink, you have to, the only way they shrink is by withdrawing your attention. So when you know your sister-in-law is trying to jack with your vibration, then what you have to do is not allow her to jack with your vibration. So you allow her to talk about you in your own head. It's okay. So it sounds like this, you know, I'm sorry that your sister Nancy feels this way about me. That is, but she's entitled to her opinion of me. I don't have the right to tell Nancy how she needs to see me. Nancy has a right to think I'm a bitch. Nancy has a right to not invite me to that bridal shower. Nancy has a right to dislike me. Nancy has a right to talk bad about me. She can, she has the absolute right to talk about me in any way she wants. I have absolutely no control over what Nancy says and I'm okay with that. And I am entitled to how I feel about Nancy. And it's okay if I don't like your sister and it's okay if I don't want to go to that bridal shower and it's okay if your whole damn family talks about me and it's okay if I never get invited to another bridal shower again and it's okay if I don't get invited to the wedding and it's okay if they don't name the baby after me. I'm okay. So that is what I eventually learned to do. And it was like the heavens opened up. Ah, it was like, nobody has to like me. Nope. I don't have to like everybody. Nope. And I am not bad if people don't like me. You see, that's another limiting belief. It's all tied in with the brainwashing. So the illusion is, and it all came from childhood, you is a bad girl if people don't like you. But it's, that's a lie. That's a lie. There are bullies out there that just don't like other children. 
That doesn't mean I'm bad because the bully doesn't like me. Not at all. But you see, dear one, unless you use this, unless you use this beautiful brain that creator has given you to rewind the tape and and pull out the cobwebs and the spider webs and clean out all the closets in your brain. You gotta clean it out, open up the windows. Oof, you know, just spring cleaning. Well, it's fall now, but what I, you know, you know what I mean. You just clean everything out, get the bleach in there and you know, watch videos like this, whatever, watch videos on narcissism, watch videos on childhood brainwashing and childhood emotional neglect. See it for what it is and you'll be able to rise above the programming. And I will tell you, that it is so much fun to be emotionally free. When you get to a point where you're like, it's okay if they don't like me, it doesn't mean anything. It, my mother was wrong. My father was wrong. People don't have to like me. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that I'm a bad person if you know Grandma Bertha doesn't like me. It, it, it doesn't mean anything. It just means that Grandma Bertha doesn't like me. She, and she is entitled to her opinion. It's all good. It's okay, dear one. At the end of the day, regardless of, there's so many at the end of the days, by the way, but for this video, at the end of the day, you are an angel incarnated in flesh, seriously. And when you came here, a great sleep fell upon you. You forgot that you were an angel. And the whole purpose for coming here is to remember that, is to remember that you really are an angel and then to then to become a truly activated light body being, to turn on more DNA. I remember being in college and learning about DNA and having my professor go, it was a big chalkboard, and I remember in that moment thinking, this don't make sense. But he was telling me, well he was telling all of us, that we have, that scientists called the DNA in our beings that hasn't been activated yet, junk DNA. Are you kidding me? Junk DNA? I don't think so. There is no such thing as junk DNA. DNA is where all our codes are and information is being stored in our divine bodies. And here's the thing. Greg Braden is, is, is a master at explaining this and I would suggest that those of you who, who this information resonates with, check his stuff out. Bruce Lipton also, awesome. I would love to interview them one day and I'm gonna put it on my goal list. But what Greg Braden basically teaches, teaches is that DNA must be turned on and you can only turn DNA on by frequency, by vibration. And so if you're depressed, guess what? Guess this is your, this, this is your energy band when you're depressed, very low. But when you're happy and you're high flying, this is your energy band. So if you imagine that DNA is like, like layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of all this genetic information, almost like, you know, remember the old computers back in the day and they had all these like, these lights in the, in the panels in the, in the front of the machines. Well, DNA sort of like looks like that. So it's like railroad tracks of, of all this coded information. Now all these codes turn other abilities on in our divine being, whether it's clairvoyancy, whether it's telepathy, um, whatever. So um, our psychic abilities, our sixth senses, so some of us have those senses turned on. I'm very psychic. When, I'm, when I am coaching my clients, I get pictures in my head. I get numbers in my head. Um, and also that's, that gets better and better and better as I coach. And um, you know, that's just an ability that, that I just keep cultivating. But I always had the, the ability to feel what other people felt and feel what animals felt and feel what even the plant kingdom felt. Um, and for years I thought I was crazy, but you know, on this journey, finally learning to talk about it, I've met so many other people like, yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. I get that. So I'm not alone and you're not alone. Just people don't talk about it, you know, because we think everyone has to like us. Who the hell is this everyone, by the way, who is this person that we're trying to be good enough for? And who is this person or these beings that, <laughs> that we need to like us and why it's, it's crazy. If you stop and you face it. Face the fear, but see, that's how people control us. They control us by fear. That's how our parents controlled us. That's how the government controls us. That's how our religions control us. That's how schools control us. It's, that's how our siblings control us. That's how our friends control us. That's how our spouses control us. It's with fear. But when you face the fear and you go, hmm, let me think about that. That's why journaling is awesome. It's between you and yourself, you and creator, you know, you and the universe. And you can just go buck wild and, 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 and challenge all these limiting ideas. So um, D 
DNA that if you if you if you want to turn on more DNA, then you have you actually the, the higher you raise your vibration, the more DNA you'll turn on because vib DNA is turned on by high frequencies. So if you're depressed, you gotta get happy. You gotta be happy about your nail polish. You know, it doesn't mean you're gonna leave your narcissistic abusive husband tomorrow. You know, um, but it means that today, no matter what's going on in your experience, you have to find a way to get happy. You've got to learn to block out everything that's happening, pull your attention, pull your focus from what's happening that makes you depressed, that anchors you to their vibration. You don't want to be equal to the, the vibration of a narcissist. You don't want to be equal to your ornery sister-in-law. You don't want to be, you don't want to have an energetic, like, um, an energetic bond or stamping with people in your environment that you actually don't like. You actually want to leave them there and resonate. And the only way that you can do that is by increasing your vibration mentally through the power of your pineal gland, which is your imagination center. So do some research on the pineal gland. I'm telling you, dear ones, this is hidden secret information. This is hidden knowledge. The eye of Horus, if you look at the eye of, the eye of Horus, and um, you'll, it's, at least this is what I think. If you've ever seen a cross section of a brain and you look at the pineal gland, just do the investigation. When I look at the eye of Horus, I see the cross section of a brain and the pineal gland sitting in, sitting in the center of the brain. It looks exactly like the eye of Horus. So ancient Sumerians, the Babylonians and, and all this, the, the Egyptians, they all knew about the pineal gland. Um, we have fluoride in our water, which actually calcifies the pineal gland. I personally don't think that that's a mistake. Um, I just uh, read somewhere online where in Nazi Germany, they actually had sodium fluoride next to the watering tanks of um, prisoners of, of the of the um, of uh, prisoners in these Nazi camps. And when they when the when the guards were asked why why is there sodium fluoride here, they were told that it dumbs the prisoners down. It makes them docile. But we have so many of us in this country have fluoride in our water. So that's something to be serious about. I personally do not have any fluoride. I have a filter in, in, to, in my home that takes, that takes fluoride right out of the water and no, no one in my house um, has any toothpaste that has fluoride in it. That's what I do. Um, and so there are so many other things that you do, eating, eating like high green vegetables, to, all to decalcify the pineal gland so that you can use your imagination. And the reason that I link it to this video is because when you use your imagination, you can confront fear. And you can use it all in the power of your own mind. Nelson Mandela did it when he was trapped in the, in, in the war camp. You know, he often said, "I was never in the war camp. I was always up here." You know, no fluoride in that water. Thank God. <laughs> you know, Nelson Mandela was in his own head. Nelson Mandela was creating high flying frequencies. You know, and that's what you can do. Even if you have, you're living in a homeless shelter, you can go to bed right now, imagining your life differently. And you could, you could imagine when you're putting on your one sock or your two socks and they have holes on them, you can imagine that they're made of, made of silk. And you can, you can raise your frequency. If you're eating a bowl of mashed potatoes, you can imagine that you know, it's something delicious. You can imagine that it's a delect delectable filet mignon, whatever you want to eat, whatever you're into. You know, when you're putting on your, this is the one sweater that you own, you can imagine that it's, it's also, it's, it's cashmere and it feels good on your skin. That's what I did. Um, when I was living in my house with, with holes in the walls and stuff, I never saw the house. I only saw the future. And I was constantly in my head thinking about what I wanted to experience. And hello, have you taken a look at that ring? Just saying. I mean, I, I was a single mom with three kids and people were saying to me, you're never going to get married again. You're never going to have anything. Who's going to want you? And I was like, whatever. Look, look at the head. Look at the head. Just whatever. I'm going to stay up here. And you bitches, you all get behind me. And let's see, how, let's how, let's see where you are in, in 10 years or five years or whatever. So um, I'm sorry if that sounds like mean but that literally is the position i took it was in love and light you guys are entitled to your opinion it it's true where you're standing from where you're standing you know let's say we're going 15 or 20 years back when like my family was saying who's going to want you you have three kids or whatever i understood eventually that that was their reality and that they could never do and they could never manifest a wonderful life experience ever ever because as a man thinks or as a woman thinks so is she you know, as it is below, so shall it be above. 
So I knew and I understood and I took complete responsibility and it was not easy, dear ones. Those of you who coach with me, you have said it yourself. Like this work is tough work. It certainly is. It adds, and I will, I am not going to tell you that it's not. It is tough work, but it is worth it because emotional freedom is worth it. Oh my God, there's nothing better than emotional freedom. You don't owe anybody anything. You stay true to your vision. You know what you want because you're worthy and that's why you're born to wake up and to transcend the old dark energy so that you become a light body. And how does that benefit the world? When you become a light body, what happens is you become an anchor for future activated light beings so that they can come here, so that this universe can, can hold strong energies. We have to become light body activated. If we don't, literally on a global level, you know, we're doomed. So, because dark energies do exist. And, you know, what we need to do is become conduits of love and light and to psychically cut our connections and our cords to people who don't approve of us. And we have to cut our psychic connection and our psychic cord to thinking that those people, we need people to like us. So when you cut that psychic cord, like I just taught you, like it's okay if they don't like you. When you play with that every day, every day, every day, 24 hours a day, it's okay if you don't like me. You're entitled to your opinion. Your husband says something that has a smart ass remark. It's okay that you have that opinion. You're entitled to your opinion until it becomes ingrained, until that connection and that enmeshment has been severed and you're no longer codependent and reliant on other people's validation to make you feel good about you. You is enough, dear one, and that's, that's all you need to know. So let's dust that dirt off our wings and let's just fly. Anyway, I hope this has helped you. Um, if you guys, any of you are interested in the workshop that I have, um, it's available on my website at www.lisaaromano.com as an MP3 file. My books are available all on audible.com with a free trial. They'll actually give you a free copy, of, a free download of my books if you sign up for their free trial. But read the fine print. I don't know what, you know, I mean, you know, know what you're getting into. Know, know, know what that's all about before you actually sign on. I don't want to mislead anybody, but I, you know, I joined and I got a free, free audible.com book and I thought it was amazing. So um, my upcoming group coaching class, my, my coaching class for this month filled in like 48 hours, less than that. Um, my next group coaching class is December 2nd. If anyone's interested, just shout, you know, give me a shout out, lisaromano.com. Um, and I'll be talking to you guys soon.